Amen. How many of you have ever opened up your Bible and felt like you needed a dictionary to understand some of the words? Because our Bibles oftentimes are replete with words like justification and sanctification and propitiation, expiation, and many others. And sometimes those words can go directly over our heads and we often are like, what just happened? And some of that is because the Bible was written in a context that was very different from ours. Uh, it was written over a span of 1,500 years in three different continents and a few different languages. And, and the people that wrote the Bible, the 40 different authors, had different customs. They had a different background, a different way of thinking. So some of those words like justification and such can be confusing initially um, and can throw us off. But with a little bit of effort and a little bit of time spent, we can understand them. Let me just tell you that you don't need a seminary degree to understand the Bible. You don't need to go to a Bible college with a little bit of effort and a little bit of energy. You can understand any of the big words in the Bible. And what you'll learn is that they're replete with depth and meaning and significance. And, and with that in mind, we're going to look at a very, very important one today. And it's the word justification. Or justification. Uh, we, start, we started this series with the word sin. Even though that's not a big word, it has big implications on our life. Last week, Pastor Todd got up here and preached the paint off the walls. That's why we had to put up the pipe and drape uh, just to cover it up. He preached the paint off the walls, and, and he talked about the importance of faith and uh, the ability to put your trust in God when you know you can't trust yourself. And so today we're going to talk about justification, and, and I'm going to frame this and help you understand how this is applicable to your life. So join me, maybe grab your Bible app, it'll hop up on the screen, or, or grab your paper Bibles, and join me in Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, the fifth chapter, I want to start at verse, uh, verse 1. It says, this, it says this, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, somebody say justified, justified. we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have also obtained access to him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our affliction. I don't know how, but I'm going to explain to you. Because we know that affliction produces endurance. And endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out on our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. Therein ends the reading of God's word. So today we want to tackle this word, justification. I will never forget my first real paycheck after college. I will never forget it. I was working at this, this uh, environmental consulting firm in, uh, in West Windsor, uh, New Jersey. And I didn't have the direct deposit set up. I didn't know about that at the time, right? I think I was in the negative. And so I didn't want to set up the direct deposit initially because I didn't want my account that, for them to mess up my check. So uh, I, I, had the, I didn't have the direct deposit set up. So after a long day of work, I came back and I saw my check on my desk. And I was like, oh, this is my moment, Jesus. <laughs> no more eating $5 foot longs, Jesus. I opened up the check and it was for $1,137. Woo! I remember looking at the check and saying, God, what am I going to do with all this money? I don't know how I'm going to handle this. What am I going to do with all this cash, Jesus? I can finally go get that Bentley GT coupe that I've been looking for all this time. And then, I got to be honest with you, friends, my, my excitement quickly abated because I saw these things called deductions. I'm 24. I'm like, what is a deduction? Then I looked at it and it said federal taxes, then state taxes, Medicare. I'm like, I'm too young to be playing in Medicare right now. Social Security, 401k. And then it was this dude that took money out of my check named FICA. I was like, who in the world is FICA? If somebody could let me know, I have no idea. Even today, I'm 37. Even today, I don't know who they are. And so I remember... And then on top of that, they took out money for my health insurance. And I was like, what do I need health insurance for? What, what in the world? So I remember going home, and I was complaining to my mom, like, yo, mom, can you believe they took all this stuff out of my check? And she said, son, stop being cheap. You're being cheap. Those are called benefits. And, and what you received is nothing compared to what the company has covered on your behalf. 
And church, as I thought about that first big check that I got, and I thought about our big words of the Bible series, I'm reminded that, that when you put your faith in Christ, he gives us an eternal benefits package. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at justification, and we're going to take a look at the fine print, and we're going to examine what happens when we put our trust in Christ and experience justification. And so, but before we can understand this word justification, we need to understand this word righteousness. Somebody say righteousness. Righteousness. And he mentions it in in the A clause of verse 1. He says, therefore, since we've been declared righteous by faith, some, some passages say justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Now, when we see words like righteousness, it doesn't really connect for us, does it? Because when we think about righteousness, like we think about self-righteous people that think they know everything and they're morally superior. People that got it all together, they look down on you because they, they sin differently than you do. But when we talk about righteousness, we, it, it really has a negative implication. But, but in the words of Tim Keller, righteousness can be described as a validating performance with which opens up doors. Does that make sense? It's a validating performance that opens up doors. It's one that launches you into stardom. Righteousness is when you do something so well that people start to take notice of you. So if if it was a a producer, it would be a hit record. It would be that one hit record that got everybody in the industry working with him. If you were a scientist, it would be that one scientific discovery that caused your career to be catapulted. If you were a baseball player or an athlete, it would be like that postseason performance that launched you into stardom. Let me see if I can make it closer to home. It's like, it's like Jonathan Majors, who just starred in Creed. He had a lot of other great movies. Can we agree? A lot of other great movies, but it was this recent role in Creed Three that launched him into stardom. Does that make sense? So it's something that you do in order to get people to take notice of you and to get opportunities that would normally not be available to you. Now, some of you are wondering, okay, Pastor, I'm not an athlete, or at least I try to be, but I'm not an athlete. I'm not in stardom. So I'm not, I'm not like launched out into stardom. So how does this apply to my life? Well, we do this every day, don't we? Like, you know, like when you get a job, you take your resume and you take it to your employer, do you not? or you put it on Indeed or other sites, and you say, I want you to accept me into this position because of my performance record. Or if you apply for a job, you say, based upon what I've done in the past, I want you to put me in this position. Or maybe you're like, man, I'm I'm going into college. You're taking your transcripts, and you're using the transcripts or your application as a validating performance to show that you can handle the course load and you demand or demand or you desire to be a part of this institution. Does that make sense? So we all do this in life, whether it's getting into schools, whether it's a career pathway, whether it's applying for a job. We all do this. The problem with our righteousness, however, or this validating performance is we often try to comport this into our relationship with God. But, but we don't use academic deeds, do we? We don't use academic performance because, you know, you're talking to God. What we do is we talk about how we, we think God should accept us based upon the good things that we have done. So we develop our own righteousness or our own validating performance And then we offer it to God and say, God, you should love me based upon what I've done. So we say, God, you should love me because, let's be honest, I serve on the I Love My City team. I go into the nursing homes. I go into the shelters. God, I've done all this. We say, God, I've gone to church. I know that people come to church every 1.7 times per month now, but I come to church 2.3. So, God, can you accept me based upon that? Don't you see how I've served the community? Don't you see how I'm a social worker that's changing lives? Or I, I'm at a university and I'm helping students change their lives. God, can you accept me based upon the things that I've done? And God is like, hey, I, I appreciate those things that you do. But how, why is it that we always want be, to be rewarded for things we should do anyway? You should love your neighbor as yourself. You should use your cognitive, emotional, and physical acumen or physical abilities in order to serve people. I I want you to do that. But here's what it's like. What happens is this leads to something called self-righteousness, where you develop 
your own set of validating performance and then demand that God invite you into relationship with him because of what you've done. And he's like, I, I, I don't work, work or operate like that. And here's why. Here's why. Have you ever gone into a room and there has been an awful stench? Just an awful stench, just a, just a terrible stench. So you, you probably approached it a few different ways. Maybe you opened up the door. Maybe you turned the fan on. You did something. But if you're like me, you probably grabbed the air freshener. And you, you just sprayed it all over the house wherever the stench was, right? But the issue with that is the air freshener only covers up the stench, but it doesn't get rid of the odor. You have to get to the heart of what's causing the problem with the odor. And so what happens with our good deeds is our good deeds are like, our good deeds are like air freshener, that are, but they still leave the smell of, of sin in the air. So things like serving the community, volunteering, they're all good. But the air freshener of your good works cannot get rid of the smell of sin. It does not get rid of it at all, family. It, it doesn't matter how much you do or, or what you say or any of those things. It still is a repulsive odor, odor to God. And let me just tell you, God has an acute sensitivity to sin. Yeah. And so you're like, okay, pastor, I hear you. My good works are like air freshener, the dollar store ones because they're really cheap. So that's what they're like. It's not like Glade or any of the other stuff. So how then does God accept me? If you're saying that I can't do anything on my own, how then do I come to faith in Jesus and how am I welcomed by him? Well, he tells us right here in verse four, um, verse, in chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. Notice that he starts with the word therefore, which means that he's pivoting from all the things that he said previously, and he ends that passage with in Christ. So that means that in Jesus, you and I are justified. So God does not reject us based upon our poor performance. He accepts us based upon Jesus' performance on the cross of Calvary. In other words, you and I are welcomed into the family of God, not because we've done some great work, but because of the great and amazing work that Jesus has done on the cross for us 2,000 years ago. Does that make sense, family? Now, somebody might be saying, well, pastor, you know, well, that's good for y'all religious folk. Y'all up here shouting and hollering and all that. That's good for y'all, but that's not good for me. And I would argue that you're looking for justification in your own way because you want to be validated and you want to know that your life matters, does it not? You want to know that your life counts and that it matters. I, there was a recent interview with Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson it was the former champion, and, and he was talking about his life of emptiness after his career is over. He said, I was born or I was made for war. I was an annihilator, and now I feel like I don't have anything. Yeah. Here's what happened. When boxing was gone, he had nothing else to root his identity in yeah. because he identified or, put, or rooted his identity in something that was transient. Yeah. So here's the question that I have for you. What are you going to do when those things that you find your identity in are gone? Like some of y'all in here are workaholics. You work 60 hours a week. And it's not even that you're addicted to the money. You know what you love? The fame and the promotion. You love, a, you love another award. You want another promotion. You want another article rented, written about you. You want more praise. You want more pats on the back. But what happens when that's gone? What happens when those transient things are gone? If you root your life on things that are transient and that are ephemeral, eventually you will find yourself lacking and not finding your identity in the things that are eternal. Yeah. It'll leave you hoping. But this is what the gospel says to us. Is you don't have to anchor your, things in, your life in things that don't ultimately matter. Yeah. Because Jesus created righteousness for you and I. He created it. He welcomed us into his family. And so because he's welcomed us into his family, you don't have to be accepted into every circle. Because you're accepted by Jesus. Some of you are trying to be in every circle. You want everybody in the world to speak nice of you because you're struggling right now with people pleasing. But the main person that you and I need to please is Jesus. And when we do that, that transforms our life. Everyone cares about everyone's opinion, but I want you to get this in your soul, family. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the King of Kings, became a soldier and died on the battlefield called Calvary. 
And then when he dies on this cross, he earns this medal of honor called justification. And then when he earns it, he gives it to us. So now God's love for you is not based upon your performance. It's based on Jesus' performance on the cross of Calvary. Does that make sense? Let me see if I can make it home. This word justification is also used forensically to describe a courtroom. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not a lawyer. But I've watched enough SUV, SVU that I feel like I can speak to the process here. Right? Now, 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 now normally in, a court of, in, in, in Christian theology, in a court of law, God the Father is the judge. And you have an accuser called the devil. He's saying, don't you know that this person has lied, cheated, and stolen? Don't you know that it was just tax season and they claiming children that aren't theirs? Oh, did that hurt? I'm sorry. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Make sure I say that in the second service. I, that's, that's good. I didn't know. Don't you know that they lied, cheated, and stolen? Don't you know that if you pull up their browser history right now, you will find, there's little kids in the room, that you will pull up their bridal, if you pull up their history on their computer right now, that you would see some compromising material. Does that work? Don't you know that they are liars, that they deceive people, they tell their boss that they're late because of traffic, but they just got up. Don't you know that they have done all type, that they have backbited and they said all type of nasty things. And God the Father is like, yep, all that is true. And then Jesus says, but Father, I also want you to know that I have paid the price on their behalf. I want you to notice, Father, here is example number one. I want you to look at my crown of thorns here in evidence. I want you to look at these nails. Don't you remember that these nails were pierced through my hands and they were pierced through my side? Don't you remember this physical evidence? Look at my side. This is where I was pierced. I hung on the cross. I said tetelestai. I said it was finished. So that means that I paid for all of the sins that they've done in the past, present, and the future. So that means that they are innocent. Though they are guilty, they're innocent because of what I have done on their behalf. I don't know about you, but I'm happy that I'm innocent because God allowed Jesus to be guilty. Jesus was guilty on the cross, though he had done nothing wrong, though he had not messed up, though he had lived honorably on the cross, he became as I was so that we can be as he is. This is the gospel, friends. So when you know that the length and the level that Jesus went through to save you, you don't have to worry about everybody promoting you and everybody having good things to say about you because in the court of heaven, God deems us innocent. So therefore, we're justified. But this passage also goes on to tell us about some of the things that happen because of our justification. Here's the first thing that we receive because of our justification. Number one, we receive peace. Somebody say peace. Peace is the ability to have tranquility even in the presence of problems. It's the ability to say, I know that I can make it, and I don't know why I have this internal tranquility. It really doesn't make sense because my life is chaotic, but somehow God makes me feel settled in my heart because he's working it out when things seem to be falling apart. Um, you know, cookout season is right around the corner. Anybody excited about that? Remember, when you come to a cookout, you have to be authorized to bring the potato salad. Don't put anything weird in the potato salad. No raisins in the potato salad that doesn't go in there. I don't know if I need to say that, but it's a multi-ethnic crowd, and it's important. Right? Just make sure. Yes, yes. I just... Just wanted to be said. There are certain, there are certain rules to the cookout. Uh, you have to bring more than your appetite. Amen, somebody. You know, at least bring some ice and some Shasta sodas. If you can get those. Anyway, let me go on. So cookouts are great, but the problem with cookouts is you always have those relatives that don't get along with each other. Right? Like, you go to the cookout, one auntie is in over here, and the other auntie is over there. They don't talk to each other. They don't converse. And then you feel like, well, if I go over there and talk to them, am I betraying this auntie? So it's like a zero-sum game. It's really awful. 
What's happening is, is they're experiencing what I like to describe as estrangement. In other words, there's a beef or problem that has incurred, but they're not dealing with it head on. So it's creating a chasm between them. And so what's happened is in many ways, there was a beef or a problem between us and God the Father. And it wasn't because of him. It was because of us. We were the ones that defaced his creation. Adam was like, you know what, God, this is a nice earth that you created. This is beautiful. Well, I'm going to eat this one tree right here, this this fruit of the one tree that you told me not to, and then I'm going to cause cataclysmic danger that's going to be passed down to everyone, and so it's going to destroy your world. I got this, God. Just messed it all up. And so what happens is, because Jesus dies on the cross, he creates peace with us and God the Father. Because the wrath of God or God's reaction to our sin is poured out on Jesus. And so because of that, the father no longer has issues with us. It's all good. Does that make sense? So because we have peace with the father, that means that we also should have some peace with other people. Let me just say, if you're a follower of Jesus, like you shouldn't have beef with everybody in your life. Your whole life cannot be full of a bunch of toxic relationships. You are too old to be giving people the silent treatment and to throw in shade at people constantly, even though that's a sin of mine. I do throw shade. Help me, Jesus. I'm being delivered from it, but I will get shady in a second, right? Like, like, like all of these things, like you can't have fights and arguments with everyone. But what I'm, what I'm saying is in order for us to pursue peace, you have to stop settling for a false peace. A false peace where it looks like everything is all good, like those two aunties at the cookout, but deep down there's this real problem. What I'm saying is, is that if you're going to experience uh, the benefits of justification, you've got to experience the peace that comes through the cross and dealing with relationships in your life. Does that make sense? Here's another, here's another beautiful thing that happens. You get access. Somebody say access. I like that. Now, now not only has the relationship been rekindled, but now you, are, you have access to God the Father without a bunch of intermediaries. You don't have to go through a bunch of intermediaries, right? Um, have you ever tried to get in touch with somebody and the first thing they told you is to go talk to their assistant? <laughs> Has that happened to you before? Just me? Okay, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Go talk to my assistant. So you know what I started doing? I said, I'm not going to your assistant. <laughs> I'm going to DM you on Instagram. <laughs> because I, at least I can tell if you've seen this message or not. What I was trying to do was, right, when I was trying to raise money to start this church, I found a list of pastors online, and I didn't, t- I didn't know who they were. I just DM'd them all. I said, Pastor, I would love to learn from you. I would love to glean your wisdom. I would love to boom, boom. I, that's how I built my relationship and my rapport with them. I probably, I probably DM'd 200 of them. Maybe 50 of them got back to me, and now those 50 have been really helpful and instrumental in my life. I'm going to be honest. Like, let me just tell you, like, If you want relationships, you better get used to rejection. If you want what someone else has, they're busy. They are extremely busy, but you better get used to getting ignored, but all you got to do is keep on showing up. They have an event, you show up. They have something going, that's not the sermon today, but let me just say, let me just, so so anyway, so I just DM'd them. You know why? Because I didn't want to go through any intermediaries. I wanted to connect with that person personally. And what I'm saying is that in Christ Jesus, you don't have to go through any intermediaries. Like when you want to get through God, you don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through a chaplain. There is no gatekeepers in the family of God because of what Jesus Christ has done. He gives you an all access pass. He's like, come on over here, son. Like, can you imagine that? I don't have to send God a Gmail invitation to join me on a Zoom. I can connect with him in the morning when I wake up. I can connect with him over breakfast. I can connect in the car, in the shower. All I have to do in the words of the old church mothers is call him up and call him up. That's all you have to do. Here's the problem is that some of you are so exhausted right now because you have not been connecting with God. Like you're trying to do everything in your own power. You're trying to do everything in your own strength. You are trying to fight every single solitary battle in your life right now. How's that working out for you? But God the Father is like, why don't you come to me? And not only will I forgive you because I've already done that, but I'm going to give you access to things that you have never had before. 
I'm going to give you a family of relationships in the church. I'm going to give your life purpose and meaning and value. I'm going to give you something better than just what you're looking for. Does that make sense? Here's another one that we, another advantage or another benefit is joy. Joy. Let me just say that there is a tremendous difference between happiness and joy. Happiness, both are beautiful, but happiness is externally triggered. Something good happens, and because that, that affects my mood and allows me to experience euphoria. But joy is long-lasting regardless of circumstance, right? It's not based on what happens. Joy is enduring affection regardless of what's happening in life. The spring is coming up. I'm excited about it. Plants are blooming. Aren't they beautiful out there? Yeah, they're beautiful, but all I can see is pollen, 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 pollen. Sneeze, sneeze, sneeze. Zertex. Zer. That's all I see. That's all I see, right? Just coughing all the time. But like the plants are beautiful, but, but there are some plants that are called annuals. And annuals only pop up one time a year. Then you have those perennials, and the perennials are the things that keep on coming back year after year. They die when it gets cold outside. They make it through summer, but then the next thing you know, they start budding and they're coming back. And so what's happening to some of us in here is we're settling for annual happiness when God wants to give us perennial joy. Like what I believe God is saying is like, I need you to have, I need you to have joy and growth like an evergreen tree that doesn't lose its color despite if it's rained on, despite if the snow comes. I need you to maintain that. Yeah. And somebody's like, well, 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 does God care about me being happy? Yes, he does care about you being happy. He wants you to experience that feeling. But here's the thing. Some of us have made happiness our own, our sole goal yeah. in life. We just want to be happy all the time. And let me just tell you, you're not going to be happy all the time. You know when you can experience happiness? When you do things in accordance to God's will and then happiness is a byproduct of it. When, when, when you can live in accordance to his own will, that's when you know happiness is coming. Like, like when you're addicted to happiness, you become like a hamster on a wheel. You are always chasing after the next high, after the next feeling, and eventually you will find that it will become more and more elusive as you go down the road. Does that make sense? And then much more than that, some of us are making happiness an idol in a season because we think that, I, we think that happiness is our sole goal. But like an idol is anything you put over God. It's anything that you find more valuable to God. It can be your career, money, beauty, fame, wealth, your beautiful car, your being a certain size, a wedding, marriage, anything. Happiness is not God's greatest and ultimate goal for you and I. His ultimate goal is that we would be spiritually mature, grow in our Christ-likeness, put God first in all that we do. And what happens is, is happiness is often a byproduct that's attached to our obedience to God. Does that make sense? Here's, here's the fourth one. God blesses us with endurance. Endurance. Endurance is the ability to stay the course when everyone is given up. Endurance is the ability to continue to last when you're experiencing fatigue, stress, and other adverse conditions. Endurance says that I know that this is a rough patch in life, but I'm not going to quit because this is something God has called me to do. I know that it's not easy. I know that it's not going to, I'm not going to make it through this uh, in an easy manner, but I'm going to continue to trust God in this difficult situation. Here's the reality. I know that you've listened to a lot of preachers say a lot of things, but let me just tell you this. Life is hard. From something as hard as losing a loved one all the way down to somebody burning your coffee at Starbucks. Life is hard. But here's what God wants some of us to do in here. He just wants you to endure. He wants you to endure because he's developing your character. He's developing your hope. I remember one time, um, there was a time I wanted to be a runner. Right? This was before I was fighting the dad body. I think I, I'm, I'm getting him now. I'm beating him up right now. Right? This was before I wanted to be a, I, my dad body thing. So I was, I was running around Cooper River Park. And I messed around, got about halfway around, and, like, hurt my hamstring. I remember it hurt so bad, I laid on the ground. So why y'all laughing at that? That was, like, painful. So I laid on the ground. I laid on the ground. You know what I did? I started calling people to come pick me up. I knew my wife was at work, so I started calling people. 
I'm not going to say that I, I'm not going to tell you that I called Pastor Jacob and that he ignored me. Uh, but, but anyway, I started calling people. Started calling people. And then after I did a little bit of stretching, I got my second wind. After, after I did some stretching, I caught my second wind, and I was able to make it around the track. Y'all messed up the illustration. What, what I'm trying to say is endurance is when God gives you the ability to get your second win in the middle of adverse circumstances. It's like, God, I know that it's hot. I know that these conditions aren't what I want them to be. I know that I'm not making the money that I want to make right now. I know that I don't have the accolades or the money that I was hoping for. But I'm going to trust you and I'm going to endure because I'm going to have the character that's developed when I finally do get that thing that you want for me. That's what he's saying. We got to have a level of endurance in life, family. The, the problem is, is too many of us are willing to quit when things get hard. Quit when things get hard. But I'm so grateful that Jesus didn't quit. Because when they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, and start throwing the palms down, you and I would have quit at that point. We'd be like, well, I did it. You know, I'm the king now. You know, we would have quit. But before the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And some of you might be on the crucifix of life right now. You're going through the gory Friday. But what I can say is that resurrection is coming. Your resurrection is coming. God is using this season to cultivate you and develop you. And maybe he's hiding you in this season. And maybe he's keeping you hidden because he's trying to shape you in ways that you could never even imagine. I'm just saying, stay the course, family. Stop quitting so quickly. And listen, I'm finished up on this, but here's the last thing that he does for us. He gives us the Holy Ghost. Woo! He gives us the Holy Ghost, right? Let me just tell you, the Holy Spirit is not something you have to tarry for. It's not something you have to come to the morning bench for. The Holy Spirit is the second person in the Trinity that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he gives you immediately at the moment of profession of faith in Christ. It says so much that he seals us until the day of redemption. So that means that if we are actually walking with Jesus and saved and following him, you can't lose something that's a gift given to by him. Does that make sense? And so he gives us the Holy Spirit. Now, now, here's what I want you to know. Here's the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you know this Sprint customer. Yeah, been of life. I've been with them like 25 years at this point, right? Now they're T-Mobile and all that. But I've been with Sprint for a long time. And, you know, there's been some, some tough days with Sprint. There's been some tough days. But we've made it for the most part, right? There's some spotty reception. When I go visit my family in North Carolina, you know, I can't talk on the phone too much. But things have changed recently. I call them and they're like, wow, Mr. Grant, thank you for being, being such a Sprint customer from 2000. Is it two? Yeah, from 2000, Mr. Grant, we're so grateful for you. Uh, what can we do? I'm like, well, get, cut my bill in half. That's what you can do. Unless I'm going over to Verizon. Unless I go over to Verizon. But anyway, and so, I, so when you buy a phone, it would behoove you to buy a phone from that particular carrier. Because otherwise, if you didn't, you wouldn't get access to the larger network. Because... The phone and that carrier are something called incompatible. But they're incompatible until you do something called jailbreaking it. When you jailbreak it, what you're doing is you're re taking out some of the software and you're reprogramming it so that that particular phone and that provider can be connected to the larger network. Y'all don't look at me funny because I'm not an electrician, but you get the point. What I'm saying is, is that when you become or you put your faith in Jesus, what he does is he gives us the Holy Spirit and he jailbreaks our heart. He takes out all of the software, uninst he uninstalls that detrimental stuff in our hearts. He removes a lot of the lustful software and he installs the Holy Spirit. That's why you just can't enjoy sin like you used to. You're like, Jesus, I'm not just ready to give up this sin cold turkey. I'm just not ready for that. I was enjoying what I was doing. Not the Holy Spirit, like, he's like, no, no, I've jailbroken your heart. Now you're connected to me. And now you're connected to the wider network of God's grace. So because of that, you can't continue to go living the way that, you're, that you were living previously. And so now he's given us wisdom and direction and guidance. And, and so when you put your faith in Jesus, friends, not only are you forensically cleared from all the stuff that's happened in the past, but now he's jailbreaking your heart. And I just can't help but to think that maybe God is jailbreaking your heart right now. Some of us in here have been living in ways that we know are not in align with God's will.
Maybe you grew up in church and you heard, heard the old preacher say a bunch of things and maybe you walked down the aisle. But here's what I want you to know. That in order for you to experience God's best for, for your life, you have to yield your life to what God is doing. Either you're Lord or he's Lord, but you both can't be Lord. Either he's God and he is who he say he, he is, or you're going to be the co commander of your ship. And if it's you and if you're the commander, then your life is going to continue to go awry. But I want to encourage you, put your faith in Jesus today. Put your trust in him today. Experience the benefits of being justified, of knowing that you are forensically cleared of guilt because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Because somebody has to pay the wrath of God. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to pay it. That's a heavy tab. That's like going out with your friends and they stick you with the bill. It's like, ah, I don't want to pay that. But Jesus has already covered the cost. He's already covered the expense. And so I want to encourage you to put your faith and trust in him today. If that's you, do me a favor. There's a connect card right in front of you or on your side. Fill that out. Give us as much information as you feel comfortable. On the back of that, there's something that says next steps. Please check the box that corresponds to the next step you want to take so you can experience the love, the joy, and the peace that God has for you. Amen. Why don't you receive this prayer? Jesus, thank you so much that you're in breaking our hearts. Thank you so much for justification. Thank you that we are righteous because of you. Father, I pray that you will bless our congregation. Help us to walk in you. Help us to continue to grow in our love for the gospel and for all the things that you provide. Lord, we love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do me a favor and turn your attention.